Welcome all of you to this live program at Alternate Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Jibanan Sitpadi from Virginia, United States. Dr. Sitpadi is Associate Professor and Director of Trauma at the VC University in Virginia, United States. After his automatic residency in PJ Chandigarh, India, Dr. Sitpadi did higher surgical training in the United Kingdom. He then completed his fellowship in arthroplasty and trauma at the VCU Health System in Virginia, United States. Dr. Sitpadi has been doing trauma and arthroplasty for more than 20 years with special interest in pelvis tabular work. He's currently the director of trauma in VCU Health System, which is a level one trauma center serving the state of Virginia in the United States. He has multiple publications with focus on reconstructive surgery, as well as trauma, notably on femoral retroversion, as well as periprosthetic fractures and geriatric fractures. If you've noticed, Dr. Sathpati has delivered several lectures on our channel and today's my great honor to bring back Dr. Jibanand Sathpati for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Itais. Um, I can start, right? Yes, sure. Right, sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Hitesh introduced me, I'm Dr. Sapathy. I'm going to try and uh, present uh, this approach today, posture approach for total hip arthroplasty. Uh, it's the workhorse approach for majority of the people. Um, I'm going to try and go step by step and uh, share my experience of how you can make this e approach even easier, better, understand some of the nuances of the approach and stuff that can be done. And I'll discuss some of the cases in between and afterwards as well um, that can be done through this approach, probably exclusively some of them at least, um, and then see if I can share my experience with you guys. Uh, hopefully it'll be helpful to you. All right, so let's start with this. Um, this is my typical incision. Uh, obviously you can make it smaller or bigger depending on the size of the patient and how comfortable you are. Uh, usually I marked it out for you guys. I marked with the trochanter. Uh, my incision is usually half and half, half above the tip of the trochanter and half below the tip of the trochanter. I angle it down a little bit posteriorly about 20 to 30 degrees. Um, if their patients are bigger, I would incline a little bit more posterior. Uh, they're smaller, I go a little bit more straighter. Uh, but um, I, I keep it like on the posterior third of the trochanter as, as the marking shows here. Uh, the next part is simple, obviously, uh, skin and then uh, subacute. Um, on more obese patients, which is very typical of my population, um, getting down to the fat layer and finding the fascia sometimes um, it's a little clumsy. Uh, so <clears throat> many times I would use a cob elevator. If you're familiar with that, it's like a spatula a flat thing. Most of the US surgeons would be familiar with the cob elevator. I use a little bit of it to scrape off the fat um, from the IT band, uh, just a small area, not to create a lot of dead space, but that helps to identify and separate the fat and you don't keep dissecting through it uh, all the way. Uh, so that's uh, something would be helpful just to, just to expose the IT band area. Nothing uh, big at this point. Then next step is your IT band. I typically start splitting it right at the top of the trope and below it. I feel like that's where IT band is more epineurotic and less muscular. I find many surgeons train training, they'll try to expose the muscular layer more and then keep going layer by layer by layer. And it gets uh, very clumsy and takes time. I find it's a lot more easier to open the IT band at or below the greater trochanter. And then it's all fascia layer. You just have to abduct the leg so you don't go through it all the way down to the gluteus medius epineurosis. So as soon as I make a rent, I either put a carb elevator or finger underneath it. And then rest of it, you can bluntly split the muscle, but cut the fascia with the bovie or hot knife. Um, as um, in this mm -hmm. one. Um, so I would, I would uh, use that and then basically use my finger to split it out and split the fascia. 
and then use my finger to push it further up or you can simply use the bobby as well uh, going further up as you feel comfortable but this this makes it a lot more easier uh, to find the layers uh, and expose it a little bit more efficient way i next step would be typically i use this um uh, large self retainers we call it cerebellar, uh, but any form of self retainers um, helps to stop bleeding. Um, if you retract the skin a little bit harder, all the subcutaneous skin bleeders pretty much stop at that point. Anything bigger, you can always uh, cauterize it at this point. Then uh, I would use a Charlie um, retractor, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with this. I prefer to use the fixed arm on the side away from me uh, or anterior to the and on the interior flap. And I use that because that's the fixed one. There's a lot less control. I have at least one patient which was uh, which had a siding nerve, um, partial siding nerve injury from the uh, channel retractor. And this is more common in case of a small patient and female patient. Um, because the nerve is a lot more closer. And then when you put the posterior arm of it, you just have to put your finger underneath uh, the gluteus maximus and make sure you're not retracting the nerve with the, with the retractor. It's, it's, this is un, it's a very simple thing to do, uh, but unfortunately, sometimes people don't take care of it and it is, it is possible to actually pull the siding nerve too hard and then uh, may have a palsy way back about 12 years ago, I had a patient that unfortunately had a partial um, siding nerve, which recovered in three weeks, uh, luckily, but uh, something to think about and be careful about it at this step, although it's a simple step. Next step is, next step would be to um, have the retraction retractor under the gluteus medius, this is a, a very simple step to do. It does help quite a bit uh, in exposure of the rotators. Um, I would um, use a lap or some sort of uh, um, gauze or something to push the fat pad out like what I'm doing right now. Uh, it allows to uh, expose the rotators well. And as you can see now, the fat is out of the way. And you can see the margin of the gluteus medius right there uh, across there. And then uh, it would be simple to put a retractor at that point to insert it right under the gluteus medius. And I'm gonna forward this a little bit further. So, so like that, and you insert it right under and then it elevates the, the medius and exposing the rotators and the gluteus minimus right there. You see the piriform is exposed nicely. Um, this placement of the tractor, I feel like it's critical for this exposure um, and um, makes it very efficient. Although you can do various ways, but I find it this is quite a simple step to do to put a better exposure. The next step would be to cut the rotators. Um, I usually take a full musculocapsular flap um, that would have the rotators as well as uh, um, all, all the capsules together. Many times, uh, as you can see here, I take a little bit, use the, take a little bit of minimus as well if necessary to have a better capsular flap um, and then uh, take the rotators, uh, including the upper internus down to the quadratus femoris uh, in one piece. And it's important to use that bobby curve at the bottom, as you can see in my, in my bobby, I'm gonna replay that place uh, where you can see how that uh, the bobby is placed right under the greater trochanter. You gotta be careful, I've seen, people would cut through the gluteus medius in this step, trying to keep the length longer. Um, it is uh, is possible to cut through the gluteus medius. So just be careful in this step and stay under the greater canter, get, drop your hand down 
and you can also curve the bovi to be able to go underneath the trochanter to have a thicker uh, capsular muscular flap. I tend to bring them together. Some surgeons prefer to get the gluteus minimus separate and the rotator separate. I feel like if you go under the gluteus minimus and put a retractor underneath it, it usually severs it and has a lot higher chance of uh, getting a heterotopic ossification. So I typically put my retractor above the gluteus minimus and not retract the gluteus minimus at all uh, during the entire surgical procedure. Um, when you're cutting this uh, rotators, just be mindful. This is one, this is not the same case. This is a, actually a different case that I was doing, but this is an unusual situation where you can see um, the nerve is divided orally. That's the smaller division of the sciatic nerve and that's the bigger division of the sciatic nerve. That's the femoral head within a case of establar fracture. You see, this is a uh, tag, this is piriformis and this nerve is piercing the piriformis here. And then the bigger division goes that further down and this is the operator internus tendon. So in, in this particular situations, when you cut the rotators, you can damage the sciatic nerve. Um, this is an uncommon situations. I haven't seen many of these, but uh, many surgeons say they've seen a lot more often, but something to just be careful, palpate the nerve. Uh, when, you're, uh, when you're retracting the piriformis, always look for this uh, uh, abnormal sciatic nerve division which can lead to sciatic nerve palsy uh, if you're not mindful of this situation. Again, this is not a very common situation, but of course I've seen this now uh, as well. Um, next step is uh, tagging the rotators. Um, nothing, uh, nothing big about it, but basically I use uh, Ethibon stitches, I tag the rotators with uh, the capsular flap, I put two stitches um, uh, one for the piriformis and capsule and one for the obturator tendons in the capsule. It helps me to protect the sciatic nerve when I put my retractors uh, and it uh, keeps, the, keeps it out of my field. Also helps a lot during the dislocation relocation phase if the soft tissue doesn't fall back into the socket all the time. Um, I feel like uh, this is an important step that should be, that should be done. Some surgeons prefer not to do this step uh, again, I don't think there is anything wrong by not tagging. I do feel like it's very clumsy with the soft tissue flopping around everywhere uh, when you don't put it. Um, dislocating the hip, obviously this is the simple step. You internal rotate flex and adduct, and uh, usually it will dislocate. Now be mindful when things are tighter, don't force it. Um, things can happen, you can crack the bone specifically if it is a protrusion hip uh, or ankylosed hip or the bone is softer, certainly you can crack the femur um, or even uh, or, or the subtrochal area. So just, just be careful when you're doing this. Um, this is the simple step. You just look at the hip. As you can see, I have released the entire capsule all the way down to the lesser trope. When I do the release, I put my finger as underneath the femoral neck to make sure that there's no uh, capsular uh, attachment left out because that's uh, one reason how, why it doesn't dislocate. The other thing is to, um, you know, some, some of the soft tissues, specifically anteriorly intercapsular stuff can be obstructing you and then you can release the intercapsule as well if necessary, if things are not dislocating and it's very tight. I would keep a very low threshold to do an insight to osteotomy, specifically in a proposal hip or, or is at a not necessarily fully encalosed hip or a stiff hip that is not coming out by any other means. So I would just do a double osteotomy, take away for a bone, and then basically use corkscrew or some other device to take the femoral hyoid, sometimes even piecemeal if necessary. Um, this is a, a case of where, where trying to dislocate the hip there, you got a spiral fracture of the femur. Now I have a very simple, I guess very complicated. Now I have a full, the modular fruit to taper stem with, a, with multiple wires and a plate. So it can get really complicated from a, from, from a very simple surgery, trying to force the hip to dislocate. Um, I do a cert, I, I'm not sure how many surgeons should do this way, but I typically, uh, after the dislocation step, I actually don't do the osteotomy. Um, I use um, 
to open the canal before I do osteotomy, I use a thing called device. There's a sharp device called PickStick. And then we use, obviously, could have various names in various countries. Uh, but essentially, it's a sharp device that I use it along the piriformis fossa. I open the piriformis fossa with the PickStick. And then uh, I use the canal finder, which is a blood dreamer by hand. And um, once I open that um, canal, then I start dreaming prior to doing any osteotomy. It's, be mindful when you're um, opening the reamer op with the reamer, particularly in sickle cell patient, or if the bone is soft, um, then uh, you can go out of the canal. Um, blunt reamer usually helps. Uh, it's kind of hard to go out with a blunt reamer. But sometimes this reamer can't go on a narrow canal. This, uh, you have to have at least size two femur in a, in a, in a stem I use uh, uh, to have this canal finder to go in there. So sometimes you have to use a narrower device to get in and that will be particularly uh, complicated and be extremely careful as I can show you in the um, example next. This is a patient where it's a sickle cell patient and you can see the canal is extremely narrow, uh, even there is a block there. So canal finder, cannot go in there. Now this is a sharper, narrower device that has perforated. Now um, that's a problem. Now you created a stress riser. Uh, this now the, air, the wire was reinserted again uh, into the canal and you can see that crack in the medial side. This is a reverse x although it says right there. Um, you can see the crack right there. And now it required, you know, you can use various ways and because it was circumferentially intact, we prefer to use a um, start graft just to uh, reinforce the area rather than uh, um, rather than putting the uh, bypassing of the diaphyseal stem. And this is about two years post-op X-ray. Patient did well, obviously, uh, didn't have any issues with that. But just be be mindful on a softer bone or a sclerotic bone or sickle cell, the very narrow canal, trying to force it. Uh, I would I would even recommend using a fluoro when you anticipate this kind of trouble would be a lot lot less time consuming than to perforate and have to do something more. Um, reaming the femur typically um, um, I again ream before osteotomy. I use a power reamer. I uh, don't try to ream. I don't try to go too many sizes. I template it and then. Uh, I come like a couple of sizes up or down uh, and then uh, ream as few times as possible. And I don't cut the femoral neck for a reason. This allows me to automatically lateralize the femur. Uh, the other thing it helps is that the vet, it creates the hole it creates because becomes my landmark uh, for the shoulder of the stem. Um, because that's the piriformis force, I already made a hole uh, so it preserves that half moon separate, crescent separate area um, that gives me an idea where the shoulder of my stem will go. That also helps me where I'm gonna do my neck cut. Uh, so I prefer not to do the osteotomy. That's next step would be osteotomy for me. Uh, I marked that area of osteotomy, as you can see, it's right along the top of that hole I created. Um, and, um, Again, for this step, uh, make sure you have a retractor on the inner side to protect the soft tissue structures. The critical part to me in this to have this saw away from the greater trochanter. I've seen people start a stress riser here. They, they aim a little bit closer to the greater trochanter, they cut the greater trochanter a little bit, and the next thing you know, the troch is off. Uh, when you try to force it in a certain way, in a particularly soft bone, so be very mindful, use a thinner blade if possible, and then um, um, stay away from the retrocanter. That's something, um, um, obviously I've done it before, unfortunately, uh, this is some, some you learn by mistakes, but hopefully you guys can avoid that. Um, next step, obviously removing the head, um, uh, I use a, a Tenaculum or some sort of pointy thing uh, to grab it and then remove it. Uh, very simple step, nothing complicated here. Um, next step would be I usually prefer um, to do the femur first 
And the reason I do that is because I use a stem, I use a summit stem, uh, which uh, uh, was a fit and fill. Uh, so it follows the natural version of the femur. So I cannot change a whole lot on the stem. Uh, it goes where it goes. It has to follow the femoral canal and a very, I can only change it very little if at all. Mostly I can't change a whole lot. So once I know my femoral version, I can adjust the acetabular version accordingly. So if my version is not a lot, um, then I may add some version to the acetabulum. So if I do the femur first, then I know what to do with the acetabulum. Uh, so I prefer to do the femur first. So I start broaching. Again, um, for broaching, I tend to use very few sizes. Uh, again, I use my template. Say if I have a five, then I'll go with a three. Uh, start broaching with a three, four, and a five. Uh, if necessary, go up. If, if the size is not appropriate, then I'll go up. Um, again, be careful as you mallet it. Um, it it's, a, it's not only a visual, uh, they should be visually progressing uh, with the same strength of bite. As you go deeper, you want to hammer less hard, don't hit it harder when it does not going, uh, because at some point the bone will give up um, and you'll crack it. So um, I, would, uh, I would be very careful and listen to it when the pitch changes and uh, it is a stable, you stop. Um, so this is an ex unfortunate example where uh, this was not done as you can see, this is a severely arthritic hip. Isn't a very terrible bone. There's intrap X-ray which shows um, there is no fracture, and you see the second intrap X-ray after the stem is inserted, which is when the most of the fracture happens. Um, because as you as you remember, the brooch is a slightly smaller than the final implant because of the porous coating. And so that when you hit the final implant, I always tell my residents and fellows. Um, you can hit somewhat in the broaching, but when you put the implant, it's almost like you have tapped a pathway for a screw and then you just follow the pathway. You don't force it, can't force it. So you just tap, tap, tap the implant. Otherwise uh, you end up with the situation with the big calcar fracture and then end up with the diaphyseal fitting stem in this one. Obviously you can do other ways as well. You can repair it and cement a stem uh, and it can do uh, other others, other ways to fixation as well. At this point, we chose to put a, a diaphyseal fitting stem. And then um, another one here, this is a, a femoral deformity. Now broaching gets tricky here because you don't have a lot of space here to go. You only have a very small proximal femur. Um, so this one, we chose to use a, a microplasty stem, which is a lot shorter stem. Uh, we measured it, we templated it, uh, we broached it under uh, fluoroscopic guidance so we can actually see it, how far it goes. And then uh, we put a proximal metaphyseal fitting stem that doesn't go past the deformity. Uh, patient's doing well, this is uh, about three months post-op. Um, so some of the things that you can do through templating and understand the new answers approaching uh, on various uh, conditions, uh, femoral conditions. Um, next one is a stabular exposure. This is, a, <clears throat> so I put usually, I, I make it a little fast forward because of the um, time duration of the thing. So I put the anti-retractor, um, it calls a long human. Uh, this is on the intra column. As you can see, it's tight. The exposure is not there. Um, so here, there's some things you can do to increase the exposure. This is the second attractor going in the obturator foramen. Uh, again, uh, as you see, I'm, I do a pichiotomy, the intra capsule, which is what I did. Increase the exposure a little bit more. Uh, and then next thing is you can release the intra superior capsule that I'm doing now. And you can see clearly as soon as you released um, it will pull and increase the exposure a little bit more. As, as I will reposition the retractor, you can see the stabulum a lot more as you start releasing. And you release as much as necessary. Now you can see a lot more of the stabulum. Uh, with the inferior retractor, you got an anterior retractor and you have a cerebellar um, right on the capsule. Uh, 
Um, so this is, I release the almost circumferentially if necessary to increase the exposure. Uh, it should be called, this is position anterior superiorly, this is position in the operator foramen, and this is right on the posterior and anterior capsule. And now you can see the entire stablum circumferentially. Um, I'm taking out the labrum there. Um, you can see now very good exposure of the stablum. And then this is this is how the exposure should be. Um, this is from the top. You can see the cerebellar. Uh, I feel like this is an important component of the uh, stabular exposure that keeps it out of the way. You can see the prongs are on the capsule, so it's not on the nerve. And that pack suture helps me to keep it in place. And then um, the front prong is on the on the medius, and then some of the minimus anteriorly. And then that's your. Uh, retractor on the obturator foramen, and that's your anterior retractor, and you have nice circumferential exposure into it. Um, and this is how you want the stablum to look at. Other things you can do to increase the exposure other than anterior superior capsule release, um, you can also release the gluteal sling necessary. I haven't done that in a while, but you know some of the contracted cases, it's hard to get the femur moved more anteriorly and you can release partially or totally and then repair it at the end um, for the gluteal sling. That will help to improve as well, apart from what I what I saw me here, if necessary. So, sorry. And these are some of the some of the examples I'm showing you. How, some of the things you can do um, for reaming. Um, this is one case of protrusio. Um, as you can see here, the the medial wall is already medial than the iliohistia line, so you really don't want to ream any more medially. The trick here is to ream the rim. So you get the size that fits into the rim first, and then you hold on the reamer until the reamer just goes past the margin of the rim and you don't ream the medial side at all. I actually use this very small reamer to start with just to scrape off the medial wall, not necessarily ream, but just to take the tissue or any, any some cartilage left out stuff there, um, uh, just to kind of rub off the inner side. But essentially all the reaming happens at the, at the rim of the establum and you don't dip in and you progressively expand until you have a hemisphere because uh, many times it's almost like a U. You want to change the U to a O um, and um, have a rim fit. Uh, once you have a rim fit cup, I would bone graft it like you can see, it's nicely bone grafted there. And then uh, you put in the cup in a rim fit position. I always put a screw uh, and this one we did a prophylactic wiring I always do prophylactic wiring when, when I see uh, an older patient or if I use uncemented when a bone quality may not be the best, uh, although you can also do cemented as well. That's one way. This is another one where um, you gotta be careful reaming this one. See when they're, they're more lateral and superior, it's very easy to go in a high hip uh, on these particular situations. So. Um, when you rim, you must force your hand down. Um, obviously, medialize it first. And I'll show you some of the videos of reaming there, but uh, you have to force your hand down and make sure it doesn't migrate up uh, as you do it. I, I almost rim the, keep my rimmer um, two third, one third at the margin of the inferior, inferior margin of the establum to take this osteophytes out to be able to position it inferiorly. The other thing you need to do because it is a post-traumatic situation, uh, you don't want to go too deep. If you go very medial also, it's a problem because then you have the hardware, then you have to get into all this hardware stuff that you have to take it out. As you can see, I'm just a touch of the medial wall, um, not in exactly all the way medialized. Um, and this is deliberately done to avoid the hardware. So these are some of the tricky things um, you have to do and be careful. 
This is another one. This is a young guy, 26 year old. He was actually a track runner, surprising look at this deformity uh, until he started to dislocate uh, his neurofibromatosis. So you can see a significant proximal femoral deformity. There is barely a socket there. And he's made a pseudostabulum higher up. And again, these ones are extremely tricky uh, rimming there. So you really have to find the, the operator foramen here to know what the socket is. So my retractors, if you recall, I always position it on the obturator foramen and that gives me a guide how inferior I need to go. So my reamer starts right next to my um, retractor. So I put my reamer all the way down and not worry about what the socket is. I just start reaming somewhere here and then build up the, uh, gradually build it up to a level where it fits in or get some sort of socket there. So that's what I did. I created a socket down here. And then obviously I have almost 40% exposed um, um, cup. So I put an augment, a dome augment on which screws to support it further. Again, this one was a tricky reaming for the proximal femur. We thought about osteotomy, but essentially there wasn't there wasn't much bone here to really do an osteotomy. So I used fluoroscopy to ream, open the canal and gradually um, find my way down. I use a diaphyseal stem. And then this thing was extremely thin, almost about to break the trope. So we just prophylactically cabled the trope. This is about two years out. This guy's uh, uh, doing extremely well, um, back to his normal life uh, and doing quite well with that. Um, this is another example of tricky reaming. This is a superiorly subluxed femoral head uh, with a significant deformity. Again, uh, same thing, same principle. Use your inferior tractor as long as it's positioned correctly in the upper front and you know how, how inferior you have to go. It's very easy to get stuck in that a deformed area and because all of these established surfaces covered with scar or fibrous tissue, and all you see is this area, which is kind of a pseudo socket there. So many people, uh, inexperienced surgeons would, would try to ream it right there or even a slightly lower, but still end up with a, like a inch up high hip. And then it looks ugly, it cannot be, may not be stable as well. So it's kind of a, uh, becomes a problem. So I would recommend follow your um, Operator from in is the inferior margin, put your retractor in the correct place, and then basically start reaming uh, inferiorly next to your retractor using a smaller reamer, make it a, make a socket there. Start with the socket there and then gradually expand it uh, until you have a good fit. And then whatever is left out defect, you can either use a femoral head if you want to, It'd be cheaper probably. I didn't have much of a femoral head, but a femoral head would be a lot more cheaper to put, a, put a, as an autograph there and put some screws to hold it versus uh, augment, uh, which was easier for me here. Uh, so I put a dome augment again, and I bone grafted the uh, inner side because I had to pretty much medialize so much down um, that um, it was pretty thin medially. So I ended up putting some autograph using the femoral head left out. Uh, and then uh, this is about, uh, this person is about, this is seven, eight months out, I think, um, of the last X-ray. But again, uh, it's doing quite well. The next step would be um, cup placement. Um, uh, nothing um, tricky about it. Is a lot of experiences you needed. As, as you do more, you learn more. Um, I use, uh, obviously, you can use the transverse establishment ligament as a guide. I find it is difficult. Uh, to use a TL, many times they're calcified, many times uh, they're, it's just a, such a subjective thing. I find it's tough to use TL, although I do use as a guide, but as a secondary check rather than a primary check. Um, I use the anterior stabular margin uh, many times. Again, that can be, there may be osteophytes there, it might be accurate, but that's another check. I keep it slightly under the anterior stabulum. The other thing I use the ischium posteriorly, which you can palpate. If your socket is, or if your implant is under the ischium, then you're definitely retroverted. Uh, so that's the other check I use, palpate my finger on the backside of the ischium uh, to make sure that I'm not under. 
uh, I try to either add or over the ischium posteriorly. Uh, um, the other thing roughly I use is, is uh, I always keep my operating table in the center of the room, our rooms are square. So if you angle it to the corner of your room, uh, if you provided you have a square room and your table is in the center, uh, that's also a rough guide, not necessarily mm -hmm. the only thing, obviously you have to use all these checks, use your TL, use the interest tabular margin, use your ischium, and then uh, use the corner of the room roughly helps as well. So. Uh, multiple checks you can do. Uh, so typically um, you go in, I also use a bone tamp to get the, um, so that's almost 90 and then you drop your hand down. I use that bone tamp to slide the implant down. Many times I've seen people start hitting by putting it uh, in before it goes all the way down, then you have a posterior wall fracture. I use a curved uh, inserter to allow to overcome the soft tissue that don't want them to push me again. You can see the leg is um, forward flex, so it's about 30 degree, uh, 25 to 30 degree anti-verted now. And about, I use easily aim for 30 to 35, but keep it slightly flat cup. Um, and then um, after I position it in the socket, then I hammer it down. And that's the final implant position there. Um, I always put a screw. Um, in fact, uh, if the one screw is not adequate, I put a second screw, but usually at least one screw on all my sockets. Um, I feel like the stability check we do is not enough. And many times uh, they may not be as stable as you think. So to have a initial stability, I always put a screw. Now I'm not against people not putting screw and it's okay. Um, it's not a benign procedure to put a screw um, uh, use the anterior superiliac spine as my guide. I put a finger there and then a center of the cup and then a 90 degree posterior to it. That's the safe sector as most of you know. Uh, and you put your screw in that safe sector um, and usually it'll be safe. Um, don't plunge into it. You can damage the action iliac vein which is the, probably the most common one that gets injured. Um, in this uh, procedure, although extremely rare, but quite a serious complication. So something to think about uh, when you're putting screw, just be careful. So that's typical. I use the easiest hole that I can get into. Uh, my ASI service is in the front area this way. I'm in the safe border here, um, putting a screw, whatever, screw size didn't matter, whatever bites uh, and holds. So just one screw is usually enough. Um, next step would be uh, to reduce the hip. Uh, it's simple. Um, again, get the brooch back in. Um, And then um, obviously uh, everybody has a different ways. Uh, use a, we call a snow cone or a head ball pusher and then reduce the hip back in place. Uh, use a bone hook, uh, this blunt tip bone hook um, to pull it up to avoid the cup being pulled down. And then uh, the assistant pulls the hip back in place. Um, next thing is to check the mechanics and, and, and a trialing. I use, uh, usually I check the knee position and the, and the heel position prior to start of the surgery. So I know what was the baseline. I check with the patient how they feel, whether they feel long or, long or short. I obviously always get a leg length x-ray. So I know where they start. And then uh, the first thing is to um, check the, once I reduce it, I would uh, feel it back again, the front of the knee and uh, keeping the heels together. Uh, this one felt pretty good. Um, I also check it in a slight abduction. Sometimes people have wide hips. Um, so I, in two different positions. And then 
Usually I want it to be up to 90 degrees or at least uh, past 70 degrees, as you can see here. It is still pretty stable at 90 degree flexion. Now, one thing to remember in this particular uh, maneuver is uh, many people use, I mean, I use a McGuire frame, which uh, holds the pelvis and spine pretty stiff. So that positioner can sometimes um, work as a, make the spine too stiff and dislocate the hip by uh, making the spine too stiff. So it's almost like a fused spine. So just be mindful of what positioner you use. I would loosen the hip, loosen the positioner prior to changing my, um, any mechanics. If I, my leg length feels good, my offset feels good, then I would, uh, if it's if it's still not stable and the cup position is good, then I would be very careful before changing anything. I would always unlock my positioner and then retrial it. And if that's off, then I'll go further. Now here, there are a couple of ways I check it for my, if, if things are off, then um, I look at uh, when I'm trying to dislocate it, see what is impinging. If the neck is impinging on the cup, then it's a problem of neck and the cup. So either the stem is not antiverted enough or the cup is not antiverted or you know, retroverted, depending on which way is the instability. So if the implants are impinging, that is internal impingement, that means that you have to change either the socket or, or the stem, rarely, usually the socket. Um, sometimes um, it's a leg length issue, but obviously we have checked that first. The first step is to make sure the leg lengths are okay. If the implants are not impinging and it is dislocating, then it is an external impingement. That usually an offset problem. Um, and it could be a length. Again, length is a little bit easier to assess. Offset is kind of harder. You assume that's the offset problem when the trochanter is impinging on the front and so dislocating. Assuming length is okay, it's an offset problem. And um, you know, various there are various options to change the offset, and you can you can use whatever you want to do. Um, and this is some another one to show the offset. The other way to check the offset is the check the rotators. You see the rotators are right at the level where I cut it. So I know that's that's stable. This is I'm checking anterior instability. This is an important step as well. You check in. Um, flexed uh, and external rotation. And then we also check in extended and external position. Um, again, final implants, um, as I told you, be very careful with your insertion of the final implant. Shouldn't hit it hard, tap, 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 tap. When it stops, um, then you hit it less hard, like it's, he's kind of gently hitting it. Um, as you can see, if it's not progressing, you stop. Don't try to force it. Um, some of the examples of the cases I have done, which I felt was a, a little bit complex uh, just to discuss here. Um, this is a guy who was involved in a motor vehicle accident uh, with a segmental intercolumn, segmental posterior column fracture um, with the sciatic nerve injury. He has about 11 plates and 38 screws, had a surgical hip dislocation as well with the uh, troch screws and troch osteotomy. Quite complicated overall, with a lot of hardware on the way. Um, I think this surgery uh, probably can't be done any other way than a posterior approach. Uh, possibly the lateral approach as well, probably you can do it. Do think anterior approach would be extremely difficult, um, particularly, uh, if the hardware is on the way, then you really can't get them out because most of the hardware in, on the way would be posterior hardwares, which has three plates there. Um, all the anterior plates are inside the pelvis or on the anterior column. So this is one I, I would probably just use a posterior approach just because of the complexity also um, because of the hardware are there. So as you plan this surgery, um, I would certainly consider fluoroscopy um, or, uh, or have fluoroscopy available. I use a radiolution flat top in these things. I use, I used to have metal cutting burr 
obviously all the relevant screwdrivers uh, and uh, implantable tools you have to have. Um, and then this one, you can see that there's uh, not much healing on the on the medial quadrilateral area. The whole hip is not protrusional. The whole hip has dug inside because the quadrilateral plate has failed. But we did a CT scan. It had healed enter column, had posterior column, so it was not a discontinuity. Um, so we did a posterior approach on this one. We actually didn't take any screw other than the just the troke screw. Uh, only two troke screws are taken out and I left everything else as it is. The key for this case to do is to not to obviously medialize. I treat it as like a protrusion your hip. I rim the rim, has a very big curve. Um, I bone grafted the inner side. All the hardwares are in the inner side, which was visible. I packed a lot of bone graft uh, medially and then uh, put a large curb that is fitting on the rim and uh, we could get away with a standard primary hip with a standard cup without uh, much stuff to be done. This is about, it was done in 2019. So he just followed up last month. So was doing quite well. He's not actually recovered. He does have some neurologic pain, but uh, he's doing quite well. So you can get away with this, uh, even if it looks very complex, if you're careful about your reaming and uh, you follow the principles, you'll be able to get away without a lot of difficulty. Um, this is another example. This is a gentleman with the osteogenesis imperfecta uh, with multiple fractures. He's, he's a very short guy. He's like a four foot six inch, six inches. So uh, he has a stress fracture on the femoral neck, has a, old, I believe is a concern nail um, with a deformity that has partially healed. Now, again, this gets quite complicated. Um, again, I would, I would assume this will be a posterior approach only um, because of the complexities, hardwares that needs to be removed. Uh, also, he has a, as you can see, he has a deformed pelvis um, and has a fixed pelvic obliquity as actually more visible in subsequent x-rays than this one. And you can see it's a very shallow socket, it's a very small socket. So there's a lot of challenges um, when you try to fix this. And, you know, again, this one, we thought about whether we can get away with the shorter stem and you really can't because this, this, this seems to be a problem here. This may not have healed or it may crack through right there. If you want to bypass it, and this femur is quite curved now, you can't bypass it without an osteotomy at the side. And um, if you do bypass it with the osteogenesis and perhaps perfect, uh, you really want to uh, span the femur uh, and then also protect uh, the distal femur so it doesn't crack around the implant. Makes it quite challenging overall. Um, so what we did is um, we, um, we did the osteotomy. We use a AML stem. This is actually an eight inch AML stem that goes to this entire femur even though because it's short, short. Um, so we went all, as far as down we can and then we spanned it with the plate to protect it. The plate was actually further down. I uh, Subsequently, it was bothering him. His IT band was rubbing. So we cut the plate off at some point and then filled up the holes with um, Norian, which is a, uh, was a calcium uh, substitute that we put in to fill up the bone to make sure the screw holes are covered. Um, and um, this guy does very well, really well. He's about, he bikes about a hundred miles a day. Um, I can't believe it, but he does. Um, he's a very active guy, is, is still kind of holding on to the other side. He has a big hole there. We keep watching it. Hopefully it won't break it, but uh, other side will be slightly simpler because of the straight femur. But again, this is something you can only use through a posterior approach. Uh, we use the cup. As you can see here, a cup is quite vertical as far as the position is concerned, but for his pelvis, uh, that's where it needs to go because his pelvis is so tilted that this actually almost looks like a 30 degree angle there. Mm -hmm. But if you actually correct the pelvic tilt, this will be quite vertical. Uh, but again, you have to think about the anatomy of the position of the patient, where he goes and how he stands. If I put it uh, flatter than that, this essentially will be reverse, almost like I have to really put it flat to get it right for, for, uh, for the anatomy. But for the physiology of his practicality of it, this has to be vertical. So stuff that you have to kind of plan it ahead 
and think about it uh, when you when you do the surgery here. Is the last one. Um, this is a gentleman who had a, a previous fracture. Um, initially had a stabular fracture, and then subsequently also had an intertral fracture that was uh, operated and fixed uh, with a long DHS with the multiple screws, and now. Um, he has a severe deformity in the right knee and has a AVN with collapse on the left. Uh, it's quite complicated overall. Um, you know, it challenges your hardware on the establishment side, your hardware on the femoral side. Uh, again, when he did the surgery, uh, we used the same principle. I tried not to remove all the hardware to protect the femur, and we left the bottom screw, put some wires, held the plate where it is. It's almost intraosseous though. This plate was almost intraosseous. So we cut the top, make it a lot more easier. And then use a simple stem, a standard primary summit stem. Uh, again, a large cup like I did before. Large cup, not to medialize it all the way. Uh, we left it as a rim fit, bone grafted it on the medial side. Uh, we had to take few screws that were loose on the way. Uh, but left most of the hardware in place. This is about four years out. I replaced his right knee as well. Uh, looks a lot straighter and a lot better. Uh, again, the standard principle, standard approach, uh, standard mechanics uh, overall did very well. Hopefully it was useful to you guys uh, um, um, with uh, my experience and uh, some of the cases that I saw in you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Jim, you can stop sharing. Yeah, and uh, please switch on your video. Actually, the video was turned off in me. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jim, for this detailed surgical presentation. I'm sure it's going to be useful for a lot of people. A few questions, Jim. Now, Jim, there is a, at one point of time, there was so much of importance for this coplanar test, right? the combined anti-washing. So how do you actually measure it during uh, surgery? So I, I don't necessarily use uh, the Ranavath test um, uh, to measure the version. I go by the mechanics of it. Um, I have occasionally used, so basically you are making it coaxial and then flex the hip. So it, the head ball is parallel to the Establish a margin so they're in the same place and then you forward flex it and how much rotation and how much flexion you do determines your version and, uh, and the abduction angle. Um, but as you do more of these stuff, um, I use most of my um, inclination using the template. So template tells me what angle I'm gonna put it and it shows me how much uncovering is there on the margin when I put the cup to, as, uh, to achieve that angle. So I kind of go with my template for positioning of the socket. And for the version, um, I told you the stuff I use. I use the entry margin, I use the ischium, I use the TL, and I use the corner of the bone positioning the table. Um, and usually that seems to be the more accurate way for me. And then ultimately the mechanics, I obviously check when I trial, the impinging and not impinging and whether I have to change the position at all. Thank you, Jim. And Jim, traditionally it was con uh, considered that the run up, I mean, the posterior disloca uh, dislocation was the complication, right? Instability was the uh, significant complication associated with the posterior approach, posterior dislocation especially. And then came the concept of the Ranavat Coastish that you suture the external rotators using drill holes into the proximal femur. Do you do that? Yeah, I didn't sew it actually. Yeah, I do. Um, I the tagging sutures I do. I make actually uh, easy two or drill bit to make holes in the trochanter, and I have the both threads. Uh, I take it through each hole and then tie them together. Um, so I should have shown that. Yes. So I do always repair the rotators uh, every time if I can. If I can, so sometimes they're like a protrude your hip. So you lateralize them quite a bit as you put the cup more lateral and then you bone graft it. And it's hard to repair. So I will repair them to the gluteus minimus and intercapsule directly suturing as much as I can do. Um, but I tend to anatomically repair the capsule and the rotators if I can. If, I, if everything comes together, 
I would put a stitch along the intra capsule that I cut that I made the my incision uh, super superiorly into superiorly, and I also repaired the piriformis and obturated tendons into the trochanter using antibond stitches that I did. Thank you, Jim. And Jim, I mean, I was really excited about the corner of the room concept. Even I've thought of this before. Is it published, corner of the room? No, uh, this is more like, you know, uh, obviously corner of the room is something uh, you have to be careful, make sure that corner is actually, your table is center and the room yeah. is square. Otherwise you can end up in the wrong way. So just, uh, just have to be something, uh, is something, it's, it's more like a observation <laughs> for a lot of um, I would see it as a secondary uses rather than a primary uses. I would use the anatomic landmarks as a most of your uh, way to measure the angles rather than corner of the room. But corner of the room kind of gives you a guesstimate. It's just an idea where you're going, and then you can adjust based on other anatomic landmarks you have. Thank you, Jim. Jim, we also joined by Loy. Loy Al Khatib is an orthotic surgeon based in Dubai. Loy, welcome to the show. Any questions to Jim, please? Thanks. Uh, good evening, guys. Thanks, Jeff, for the amazing presentation and talk. Um, actually, there's no question, but I'm interested in rehabilitation with different approaches. Do you think there's a big difference or a significant difference in a rehab uh, after, or especially early early phase uh, between these dif different approaches, posterior, lateral, direct, lateral, anterior? What do you prefer to get the patient uh, or to provide the patient uh, uh, a fast rehab? I don't see a difference. I did entry approach for uh, some time. And then uh, I have done lateral being trained in England. Um, and then, you know, I do sometimes lateral, uh, but I do prefer posterior mostly. I haven't changed my rehab protocol for any of these approaches unless I feel they're high risk. You know, certain people with the uh, spine fusion, um, bad, uh, like a lumbar pelvic fusions or people with a history of dislocations, or I would worry about the compliance if they're like, you know, the only thing I tell the patients that you can't fully internal rotate the leg um, in a seated position. So that's one thing like, you know, some of the females they take their shoes by rotating the leg all the way out and pull that way. So something I tell them not to do it. And I tell them you can't have a full squat. You can't do like a full Indian squat. Those are the two restrictions uh, that I put on my patients. Other than that, there's no difference in rehab. I'm sure entry approach has uh, same thing for how they do. Um, but otherwise I tell them what you can do, you do. I have no problems. Okay, gotcha. Thanks a lot. I, don't, I think don't think we have uh, more questions about that. Uh, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, again, that's, Jim. All the, that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all the way.